May I welcome you all to this webinar uh, being hosted by the European Law Institute. It's to celebrate the uh, and give greater publicity to the excellent report that's been written uh, uh, on freedom of expression as a common constitutional tradition in Europe. And the origin of the report was to look at how you ascertain common constitutional uh, provisions within the European Union and elsewhere in the continent of Europe, and to see to what extent, if you do a proper analysis, uh, you can see on certain fundamental rights and other matters, the commonality that binds all in Europe, and particularly those in the EU, uh, with shared values and shared important constitutional provisions. The European Law Institute was very, very fortunate uh, in uh, <clears throat> the way this report uh, was carried out. Uh, it was headed by Judge Sabino Cassesi, who couldn't unfortunately be here, uh, but we have two who were, who were critical contributors to, to it, Professor Mario Comba and Professor Ricardo De Caria. Uh, Professor uh, Mario uh, Comba uh, was uh, and is the professor at the University of Turin, where he teaches comparative economic law and comparative public law. Uh, he has some public appointments and is a great expert on public law matters, and in particular on procurement. Uh, professor Ricardo de Caria is an associate professor at the same university and a visiting professor at the law faculty of the University of Lyon, of Jean Moulin. He's co-chair of the Italian hub of the European Law Institute and of the uh, Turin Observatory on Economic Law, and has lots of other interests in legal matters, including in particular, the new generation of uh, ways of creating contracts and dealing with assets. I am I'm very therefore pleased to welcome them to, uh, to explain and introduce uh, their report. Uh, I will leave uh, either uh, Professor Comba or Professor De Caria to start uh, and the other will then uh, follow. I will uh, look forward to this with great interest. All I need say, it's a wonderful report, very clear and makes uh, I think evident to all uh, the importance of our common constitutional traditions, and in particular, the importance of this constitutional uh, tradition, which is freedom of speech. And we will turn with the other panelists to look at the broader implications and the importance to contemporary Europe uh, of uh, the importance of freedom of speech. Professors uh, uh, Dekaria, Professor uh, 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 and Comba, I leave it to you now to start. Uh, Mario, would you like to start? Uh, uh, would like me to, to go first, whatever you prefer. Uh, okay, maybe. Uh, may, maybe I'll go. Um, I think you better, uh, Ricardo. All you... right, all right. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, Ricardo, you go first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much for your introduction, uh, Thomas. It's. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, virtually today with, with all of you. And um, it was indeed a pleasure to work on, on this project. It was a privilege um, to, to, to be able to, to reflect uh, on, on freedom, on the current state of uh, the art of freedom of expression law in Europe. Um, and, and to do it, um, uh, thank, uh, thank, I mean, on, with, the, with the help of such, uh, generals and authoritative um, national reporters, uh, some of whom are with us today um, as panelists and, and in the public. And I would like to thank them very much because the, the report wouldn't exist without them. Uh, as uh, speaking of, of thanking uh, and acknowledgement, uh, I would like to thank myself uh, personally, Professor Sabino Cassese, because uh, originally it was uh, uh, the project came from his mind and, and it came from the idea of looking at um, Article 6, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the European Union, 
um, and, and if you want to take it seriously and, and, and to look at uh, what the, uh, the phrase on constitutional traditions common to member states means. So we started this, this effort as a, as a study on, on common constitutional traditions in general, but at a, uh, quite, quite soon we decided to focus on, on one uh, tradition and precisely on freedom of expression or freedom of speech. Um, and so uh, since here we're, we're asked to, to briefly describe our methodology, we, we, we decided to move forward in this effort uh, with a bottom up approach, meaning that we, uh, we decided to draw some questionnaires, which is a quite um, commonplace way of moving forward in, in comparative law expert, uh, efforts like, like this one. Uh, and so we, we drew a, a list of questions and, uh, and asked some very qualified uh, national reporters to uh, reply to, to our questions. Now, uh, one first um, caveat, if you want, one, one first uh, um, uh, I mean point of, of, uh, that, that we need to underline is that uh, uh, obviously we might have forgotten something in our questions, we might have, um, uh, decided to underline some issues and, and we, we might have uh, left something uh, aside. Um, one thing I'd like to mention in particular is that um, um, it's something that we left aside, but that was intentional, uh, but as it's raised some discussion, so it's, I'd like to, to bring this, this point uh, up um, right now, uh, which is the issue of new technologies. Uh, you, you, Dr. Thomas mentioned in the introduction my interest for for new technologies in general, and, and it's certainly true, and it's certainly very relevant for freedom of expression today, but uh, we, uh, we were always um, careful about identifying a tradition. So we, we found that it was um, quite hard and to a certain extent uh, counterintuitive and maybe contradictory to identify a tradition in something so new. So we, we rather, Try to, to draw and to build on, on what has been um, uh, uh, what has, has a certain, something that has um, added up over time. Uh, so uh, an essential component of tradition is certainly the, the passing of time. And, and therefore, we definitely touched upon the issue of new technologies and freedom of expression, but uh, not, it's, it was not a central part of the report, but that was intentional. Um, uh, so our, our approach, our methodology, was, our methodology was bottom up. We, we, we received these reports from national ex experts and, this, and, and then analyze and try. And the report is what results from a comparative analysis of all of them. Um, and we, uh, I mean, we, we will, but there's no time to, to summarize the, all the, the points that we, that we uh, common commonalities and differences that we identified. But certainly, we, we identified censorship, uh, the prohibition of censorship as, as, a, as a key uh, element, as a key component of freedom of expression across the board uh, throughout all the, um, the countries that uh, have been uh, covered, which is, uh, are, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 21. Um, uh, so uh, quite a large. Um, uh, extent of the of the European Union member states, uh, and so the prohibition of censorship comes up, um, uh, meaning the the prohibition uh, of, of a prior restraint of the press to publish information and to distribute information. That's something that that is that the bedrock of freedom of expression. Then there's obviously many differences, and and I, I leave it to to Mario to add something. I just wanted to. Uh, to add a note about our difficulties sometimes. Um, we, for example, we, we asked some questions about uh, hate speech, um, but obviously um, when reading the reports, we realized that uh, not all jurisdictions have, and all tra national traditions have obviously the same understanding of hate speech, for example. So uh, the definition issue was, was quite problematic sometimes, uh, even for a very notion of freedom of expression itself. Uh, but then also for its so for its subcategories, uh, so commercial speech or, or religious speech or again hate speech uh, are categories that ob obviously do not um, necessarily align uh, and mean the same thing uh, across different jurisdictions. 
uh, that was something that we tried to take into account, factor in our analysis and, and acknowledge uh, in our report. Uh, and I hope you will find it interesting and, and will, will contribute to the debate. Uh, we, will also, we also had some practical um, uh, goal in mind. So maybe Mario wants, maybe you want to add something about, uh, about the, the idea of the report, not just being an academic effort, but uh, trying to aspiring to, to be a little bit more than that. And I think that's it for the moment. If I want to keep it to the time that we were assigned. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you to all, in particular to ELI for organizing this first presentation of our report. Uh, I cannot mention all the support we got from ELI and specifically from single members of ELI. So I leave it to John to remember all of them. Now, the, uh, uh, what Ricardo uh, said was uh, and is a very accurate and I think complete report synthesis resume of our job. Just let me focus on two specific points which can perhaps uh, be then uh, object of questions and of discussions. The first one which was already mentioned by Ricardo is the methodological approach. Well um, perhaps John already remembered that this research, research about uh, uh, freedom of speech as one of the common constitutional tradition as of Article 6 of the treaty uh, is, I would say, a part of the original um, idea of research, which was very much more ambitious, because originally the research was in general on to the um, common constitutional traditions of, uh, of uh, state members. Um, but after uh, more than, no, a little bit less than one year of discussion among the members of the, of the board, uh, the idea was that it was not possible to, to cover all the area. And so we decided together, together with Sabino and with the board of ELI to reduce and to concentrate on, on, uh, on freedom of speech, which is historically, I would say the first, um, one no, historically the first of the freedom which are covered by the uh, European state members. So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. the first, uh, 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 the first, uh, I mean, information we got from our uh, trial, from our essay to to do this research, I would say is a negative one, but not in a moral sense. It's a negative meaning that um, we it is as far as, as we know, impossible to cover the whole idea of common constitutional tradition unless you begin from the um, bottom. That is, unless you begin from single common constitutional traditions. And so we are waiting uh, for uh, new volunteers uh, who wants to cover other common constitutional traditions in order to do, perhaps in the next future, uh, a possible um, uh, rehearsal of all of them and uh, a trial to find what are the uh, common elements to common constitutional traditions. As you know, there is another group of ELI who is working on something similar, um, uh, which comes from the common constitutional traditions and goes to common principles, underlying the difference between a constitutional tradition and a principle. Um, the, the second focus I would like to um, mention is in fact again the, the complete the opposite of the first one uh, which means the um, practical uh, consequences of our reserve as you know ELI is not an academic uh, corporation it is uh, made for judges for lawyers for uh, uh, practitioners for, for members of the European Parliament and so on and so we tried to distill uh, a single specific uh, use in order to compare them, in order for practitioners to compare them with their national rules and see what is, how and where is collocated the national legislation. And of course here, again, we had to crash with one of the very, one of the basic difficulties of comparative law, which is to build a common model starting from uh, existing uh, legislations and then come down 
and compare the common mo model with the existing le legislation where we uh, begin from. Uh, but this is the result, and now even more, even more now and in the present historical situation, uh, we think it is practically important to know to, to have some uh, uh, firm points in order to know what is really common in, uh, in European member states about the freedom of speech. Thank you. Mario and Ricardo, I thank you very much for that very clear exposition. And now we're going to go to the first of our experts uh, in relation to the report. They're going to comment a little on the report and, and bring to life various aspects of it, particularly against the contemporary issues in Europe. And we're going to start with Artemisia Tatiana Ciska. Uh, she worked at the Constitutional Court in Romania after an extensive, uh, what I would only describe as a European education, very wide, and for a, a, a number of years, uh, she has been uh, on the Media and Information Society of the Council of Europe and now is head of the Media and Internet Division and secretary of the Steering Committee on Media uh, Information Society. She has a profound understanding, as you can tell from her experience, of the importance of um, the media and the importance of freedom of expression in this context. Uh, in my handover, to you, uh, therefore, now. Uh, thank you very much, dear chair, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, for the idea to invite the Council of Europe to, then, to attend this event. And uh, of course, I'm uh, pleased and honored to participate on behalf of the Media and Internet Division and to, to share some, some information also on our work. But of course, I would first like to start with some brief remarks, uh, rather of general nature. I'm not, I do not pretend to be an expert in your report, but uh, uh, I, I read it with uh, great interest. And I can say that it is really a welcome project, which uh, brings us back to the actual core issue. Uh, that namely that freedom of expression is one of the essential foundations of democracy. And uh, of course, so this is often stated in various uh, reports and uh, documents, uh, whether legal or political or more practical, and it is taken as, uh, as self-evident. This report has the ambition to explain, to explain the reasons why indeed freedom of expression is um, foundational for democracy and uh, to, to um, um, analyze how it has become, you know, a key element of the European constitutional tradition. I noticed in the conclusions of the report, it is stated that freedom of expression is an instrument of democracy and this report tries to um, to, to uh, illustrate how at national and European level um, all stakeholders uh, holders concerned are, are working with this instrument. Um, of course, the report also illustrates and uh, discusses um, more specific, more differentiated national approaches and traditions. Uh, it identifies common denominators, but it also acknowledges through the analysis of the input provided by national uh, experts that there is still a scope for further common work in the area. There are differences. Um, it is a comprehensive report and uh, I'm glad to, to note that uh, there are many reports dedicated to one specific dimension of freedom of expression. Uh, this report covers both you know, definitions, the subjects of rights, the limits, the limits to the limits, uh, case law, uh, national and uh, European approaches. And um, it also invites, uh, first acknowledges the challenges uh, resulting from new, new societal developments, in particular the digital development, the development of digital tools of artificial intelligence and their impact on freedom of expression, and uh, invites uh, reflection on, on challenges to enjoyment freedom of expression in the digital era. And the final comment, I would say, 
um, the, the report present itself as a practical tool. Uh, my uh, um, predecessor in this list of speakers just uh, stated it, that uh, the intention was to provide a practical tool, a checklist to, pra to practitioners to navigate in this complex, you know, uh, notion of freedom of expression. And um, I was pleased to note in a footnote uh, a reference to the um, rule of law checklist of the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe. For having been working for the Venice Commission when that rule of law checklist was developed, being developed, I can uh, only um, say that it is indeed uh, not an easy task to to select put together and articulate in a, you know, in a brief but comprehensive report, in a brief and comprehensive tool, the, the various dimensions of freedom of expression. And uh, for that, I would like to congratulate the authors. Now, if you um, allow me, I would also turn to our work at the Council of Europe on a number of issues which uh, are um, addressed in this report. Um, I would say that our work is sometimes more focused on more specific dimensions. It's, um, the aim is less to provide comprehensive reports and more perhaps to explore the new challenges and uh, emerging you know, issues and to alert the political um, leadership of the organization. Uh, from this more political perspective, I would like to say that, uh, of course, uh, freedom of expression was always high on the agenda of the Council of Europe. The recent um, years, you know, declarations adopted at the end of um, each chairmanship of the Council of Europe um, always contain statements um, acknowledging uh, freedom of expression, freedom of media, and the protection of uh, journalists and their safety as core values for the Council of Europe. Um, when it comes to the legal dimension, of course, we have the European Convention and its uh, case law, as well as the supervision mechanism uh, of the um, execution of the court judgment judgments. At the same time, the, um, the Council of Europe has continued to uh, develop standards and my committee, um, the steering committee on media and information society is uh, actually the standard setting body of the Council of Europe in that uh, field. Uh, it, is, it was in, entrusted by the Committee of Ministers to, um, to steer the Council's work in the field and to develop uh, standards where, where necessary, in particular to, uh, in recent years to, to respond, to try to offer responses to the new challenges. And I would like to inform you of uh, several recent uh, documents um, adopted by, by uh, my committee, the CDMSI, and uh, finally confirmed and adopted by the Committee of Ministers as, doc as instruments of the Council of Europe. First, they, all, uh, they were all adopted this spring by the Committee of Ministers. A recommendation on uh, principles for media and communication go um, governance in the digital age providing um, guidance, uh, procedural and substan uh, substantive principles for adapting media and communication governance to, to the new challenges, to the new context. Another recommendation is dealing with electoral communication and media coverage of elections. Again, in the light of the challenges raised for the fairness and the legitimacy of the elections, um, due to the new formats and the two techniques of online campaigning. Another recommendation is dealing with the impact of digital technologies on, um, on freedom of expression, on the enjoyment of freedom of expression, and provide guidance on ways to, on the one side, to enhance the positive aspects of uh, the impact of digital technologies, and on the other side, to to limit the, to address the adverse um, consequences. Um, another important topic uh, in the work of the Council of Europe is covered by um, a recommendation which will be on the agenda of the ministerial session of, in Torino um, on the 20th of May, the end of the Italian chairmanship. And this recommendation is addressing hate speech from a more comprehensive perspective 
and has a particular focus on combating hate, preventing and combating hate speech in the online environment. And finally, another recommendation, which was uh, pending for some time due to objections by a former member state of the Council of Europe. Um, it has just been adopted. It deals with, uh, it calls uh, member states to um, provide uh, a favorable environment to quality journalism. Quality journalism essential for people's access to quality information, to reliable and pluralist and independent information. And um, I don't know if I still have one minute. <laughs> okay, so since we're speaking of uh, digital developments, uh, my committee also provided, also um, uh, adopted and published last year too, um, useful guidance notes, more practical tools, one uh, on, con on um, approaches and frameworks, legal frameworks for content moderation as a follow-up to a previous recommendation of the Committee of Ministers on the role and responsibilities of internet inter intermediaries, um, and a second guidance note on prioritization of public interest content in the online environment. Um, and for the future, we are going to deal with the SLAPs and to, to work on a future recommendation on uh, SLAPs, um, on guidance on digital, um, on combating disinformation in, in the online envir environment, as well as on uh, guidance um, on the use of artificial intelligence by journalists and for journalists. And my last sentence, since uh, the report that uh, we are discussing today is mainly dedicated to European Union developments, European Union member states, uh, the Council of Europe, the cooperation with the EU institutions. We seem to have lost the connection. Um, maybe you can come back to this later and we'll press on now. I think what we'll do is proceed now to the next speaker. But before doing so, can I merely say, you've all seen the message from the team that's organizing the seminar. You've got a Q&A box at the bottom. And the last speaker who was, gave us an excellent presentation has raised a lot of quite interesting issues uh, to discuss. And I hope you will start posing questions uh, in the Q&A box. Well, now, can we go to our next speaker? Um, uh, who is Mardis Ernit. Uh, after working at the Estonian Ministry of Justice and being the Vice Chancellor of Justice in Estonia, he taught at the University of Tartu and became a judge of the Administrative Chamber of the Tartu Court of Appeal and has been uh, a uh, judge there since uh, 2012. Uh, since 2021, he is the Estonian national expert seconded to the Directorate for Research of Documentation of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, he is going to uh, have a short presentation, again commenting on the report, uh, and dealing uh, in particular some recent judgments of the Court of Justice. I think maybe what we ought to do is we can switch around the speakers because it's, it, it, they don't have to be in a particular order. Um, and and uh, could I ask Jana Toom if she'd be happy to go next? But let me introduce her first and express our deep gratitude uh, to her for, for coming this e evening. Uh, she's uh, a very distinguished career, being uh, the chief editor for the Tallinn newspaper Stolitsta. Uh, Vice Mayor of Tallinn for Culture, served in the legislature uh, <coughs> before being elected to the European Parliament, and she's now in her second term. And she has a particularly distinguished role as Vice Chair of the Committee on Petitions and a member of the Committee on, uh, on, on the Libe Committee and of the delegation to the EU-Russia Parliamentary Cooperation Committee and numerous other parts. I look forward very much to her view about the importance of freedom of expression in contemporary Europe. It's a great pleasure and privilege and honor for us to have you present and I think shows the real desire of Edie to work very closely with, with, with the Parliament of Strasbourg. 
and I can see uh, Judge uh, Ahmed back. Can we come to you uh, after Yanatoun? Yes. Yes. Judge is trying to say something, but we still cannot hear you. I think we okay. need him for a minute. Could you continue, uh, uh, Jana Thun? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, and it's really a great pleasure. But I have to say that this panel is out of balance. You have two Estonians there. Uh, but okay. Well, I think for that, us. if I can merely say this, that, that I think it's very valuable in the current context for your views on the importance. I absolutely agree with you. Good. Right. Yes. Go. So thank you for, ha for having me. Uh, yes, I will. I will try to, to to fit in my ten minutes, and I will try to be uh, on this uh, European Parliament side, so to say. For frankly speaking, everything uh, everything good and bad was already said about this report, and uh, I fully agree with what was said by uh, Artemisa, and uh, I will not waste your time on that. Uh, but. Uh, to my point, so to say, uh, European Union continues to be continent that scores best on media freedom, according to the World Press Freedom Index. Media freedom and pluralism <coughs> in the European region. I'm sorry, I have a barking dog there. Can please somebody get it <coughs> somewhere? I'm sorry. However, media freedom and pluralism in the European <coughs> region have uh, deteriorated in recent years <coughs> with the coronavirus pandemic. <coughs> Uh, exacerbating this process. Journalists and other media professionals are facing increasingly hostile environment in a number of European member states, uh, with cases of violence, stress and harassment growing at an alarming rate. Uh, the reason for the deteriorating situation are multiple. One of the causes for concern is the effect of the digital transformation on the media landscape. Technological advances have made it cheaper and easier to distribute materials uh, and to large, to large number of people, which created both opportunities and risks for media pluralism. In recent years, uh, there has been an increase uh, in the sources of misinformation in the media, and the circulation of misinformation has been facilitated by social media companies that use algorithms for maximizing engagement with their platforms. And this rise of misinformation can be a threat to democracy and is harmful to public debate and it contributes to discrediting the media in the eyes of the public. The increase of digital presence has also created problems for the safety of journalists and media professionals, of course, not only for them, but for them uh, among others. And it's now common for journalists to be subject to anonymous online attacks and threats and their personal data is easier to obtain by potential aggressors. And this digital dimension is added on top of the worrying trend of powerful individuals feeling lawsuits against journalists and organizations that express critical views. On the European level, uh, these concerns have been raised several times by the European Parliament. In 2013, the European Parliament called on the Commission to propose concrete legally binding procedures and mechanisms to safeguard media pluralism. This call was repeated only five years later in 2018, which means that in between uh, basically nothing was done, but still. So this call was repeated and uh, uh, now we have new political development in various member states, uh, which lead to increased pressure on journalists. During this mandate, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on strengthening media freedom in the European Union and on tackling strategic lawsuits against public participations, SLAP. While the Commission has proposed a directive on SLAP in the end of April this year, proposal on media freedom, the Media Freedom Act is still being prepared by the Commission and uh, we expect it somewhere in autumn, I suppose. The Media Freedom Act is expect, expected to increase transparency, independence, and accountability around actions affecting control and freedom of the press and to strengthen the governance of public media, including measures to prevent politicization and include measures relating to the funding of media to support pluralism and diversity. Although the Parliament has been asking for legislative measures, the Commission has not revealed yet if it will be recommendations or legislative instrument. Of course, we would prefer legislation. In the case of SLAPS, the Commission proposed a directive that is limited to civil law proceedings with a cross-border nature and recommendations that are supposed to encourage member states 
to go further and address national cases of slaps. Uh, the directive has a broad personal uh, scope, addressing anybody who wants to hold power to account, including journalists, but also activists, trade unionists, human rights defenders, and so on. Uh, it includes key safeguards and remedies, uh, such as easy dismissal mechanisms, along, uh, along with reversal of burden of proof, stay of proceedings, accelerated proceedings, uh, forum shopping, and so on. A regime of sanctions for harassers, uh, and remedial and protective measures for victims, like compensation of costs, for instance. The respective recommendations uh, presents key aspects uh, to effectively, effectively tackle slaps, such as removing prison sentences for defamation, training of legal professionals and judiciary staff at all court levels, awareness raising activities and support mechanism for victims. And it also encouraged that data collection, reporting and monitors of slaps. Uh, this is about uh, our activities at the moment, but I have to say, like a former journalist, my career in media is much longer than my career in politics. I really uh, believe that legislation can only be kind of complementary part of that. I believe in codes of conduct, and I really believe that in in a way, media is a law of a law, a mirror of uh, of society and of the state, and we know very well that in these member states where we have specific problems with rule of law, we also, we always have problems with freedom of speech. And I'm a member of committee of petition, petitions and just yesterday, we discussed a, a Polish petition about the issue which was already, already mentioned by Artemisa, the, the affordability and reflection of elections in the media. And there are huge problems uh, for some political forces just they just don't have approach to media and uh, therefore i really believe that we have to find this proper balance between legislative framework but also strong professional community and right balance before so to say interest of the states and freedom of speech and i believe that our role as politicians is to give this professional community efficient tool uh, to defend freedom of speech and media freedom thank you thank you very very much indeed um, for encompassing so much of interest within so short a period of time. It was a tour de force. Thank you very, very much. And I hope now we, we, we are technically able to uh, pick up with, uh, with Judge Ernit. I hope the system is now working. Well, let's try anyway. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go to Barbara Rukowska. But let's hope that uh, Judge Ernit, your system will now work. Uh, thank you very much. Do you hear me now? I can hear you beautifully. Thank you very much. We uh, have indeed issues uh, with Zoom um, recently. Uh, so um, I, I hope it works now. I have closed all the windows. Um, first of all, um, I thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, this is an honor to, to speak here in this uh, honored circle. Um, I have to make a disclaimer first. Um, I um, express here only my personal views. I think what we should do, maybe if we can organize it so that uh, uh, Judge Ernit can speak on, on the phone or something like that, um, or some other means of communication, because I couldn't hear him at all. And I think that's the position of everyone else. But now I, I, I did warn you slightly uh, Baba, Barbara Bukowska, that we might have to turn to you for a minute. And I say that um, it, it's an enormous pleasure uh, that uh, you're joining us this evening. Uh, you've been the Director of Law and Policy uh, at, at Article 19 uh, since, 2009, uh, since 2009. And Article 19 is an international body that seeks to protect transnationally issues relating to freedom of speech and access to knowledge. Um, apart from what must be a formidable role there, uh, she's a very active uh, participant in, in, let, in, in litigation and other action to ensure uh, that um, human rights are respected across a broad area of, of work but in particular, uh, freedom of uh, expression and freedom of speech. So we look forward very much to your presentation 
any comments you have on the report, uh, but as importantly, the relevance of this uh, to contemporary issues in Europe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will proceed with my remarks, even if Judge gets back online, correct? Just proceed and we'll try and bring him online when you finish. Okay. Yeah, so I'm sorry. It's complicated that he... to have two speakers at once. Yeah, exactly. So I'm very sorry that he was silenced by technology, but hopefully he will be join, able to join us in a minute. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation to me and to Article 19 to this uh, very interesting discussion and also for sharing the report, which I read with a great interest because, uh, as you said, Article 19 is an international freedom of expression organization. But the team which I lead is the team which works on law and policy, and we obviously follow the legislative trends in the area of freedom of expression, and we analyze different free, free, different laws which deal with restrictions on freedom of expression or which regulate communication sphere. We also intervene or directly litigate cases uh, of where freedom of expression is under threat and also engage in advocacy. And it's a great pleasure to be on the panel with people who already mentioned some of the important initiatives that are going on in Europe, such as the regulation of the platforms that within the EU or the regulation of swaps, as well as many important initiatives within the Council of Europe. So what I want, and I, I have to say that I agree with the previous remarks, so I will not be repeating or endorsing the comments made by the previous speakers. But what I want to do in my brief remarks, I want to maybe comment on the context from the perspective of Article 19 as international free speech organization in which this legislation is being adopted and maybe implemented. And then also make a couple of remarks on two issues which are analyzed in, in the report which is hate speech and regulation of the media, especially as pertaining to digital technologies. So in terms of the context, then I also want to applaud you for a very thorough, thorough report. Uh, we have um, also a monitoring report, uh, Article 19, which we call Global Expression Report, which is also based on a number of indicators. And for those who are not familiar with our, our organization and who want to see the trends in freedom of expression over the years and which parts are changing or which are declining and or improving, I encourage you to look at our uh, website where this report is. And I will send also the link to this report in the chat after I finish. So it's a global freedom of expression report which uh, monitors the trends in freedom of expression uh, in complexity, so not just uh, in terms of legislative developments, and that's why I was very interested in reading the report because it's very interesting complementarity to our findings. So in terms of the context uh, globally, as well as in the region, the question here, I have to say that we have seen a decrease in protection of freedom of expression and a decline in state of freedom of expression over the years. Obviously, we just emerged from the pandemic, uh, pandemic in recent months. And when the pandemic hit, we have to say the states, including in the region, including in Europe, responding, responded to the pandemic in presenting this false dichotomy between human rights protection and public health protection. And also in many countries, even in Europe, shut down the public discussion or scrutiny it with aim to, to shut down public discussion and scrutiny over key decisions in the names of crisis management. And over the, uh, over the couple, last couple of months, actually freedom of expression has been the biggest human rights casualty in the pandemic, because we have seen restrictions on the media, we have seen the adoption of the states of emergency that were counter to human rights standards. And we also have seen how free flow of information came under type of control, where many governments took a more interest in controlling the narrative around the pandemic than controlling the, the pandemic itself. So we have seen the global state of freedom expression has been deteriorating, but this is even more concerningly in Europe, where we have seen a significant drop 
uh, in protection in 2020. And we have actually seen that in Europe, 34% of population now lives in countries which we call crisis. And on, in our monitoring, a score which we give to Europe actually have uh, fell significantly um, since, um, although it was very steady uh, previously, especially in the last five years. And also Europe, uh, in a context why we are also quite concerned, and this is important for uh, the legislation which is being adopted or for interpretation and uh, implementation of restrictive legislation, which I will touch on in a minute, because we also see the increase of authoritarian or autocratic um, politicians on rise, continuing a pace, especially in Central, uh, Central Europe, even within the EU, where populist leadership such as in Hungary or Poland or Slovenia continue to erode the checks and balances for democracy, capture uh, independent and free media, while many other countries follow the suit. And also in Europe, this is also important for the context is that we have seen a hollowing out of institutions, concentration of power, and this removes of the, of the checks and balances and the, this, this crackdown on democracy towards autocracy is gaining control over civil society, over the media, and then chipping away democratic institutions such as um, um, independence of judiciary or a rule of law in general. So that's for the context. And now I just want to make a couple of comments on two specific issues which are covered in the report. And those are, and I want to start with hate speech. So you, um, in, the, in the report, you highlight a couple of very important trends in this area, but beyond the legislation, I also want to comment on that we have seen in Europe the rise in prejudice and intolerance that are not obviously then tackled through this legislation which you have, but also we see that this rise of, of hate and tolerance or prejudices in the society are often linked to some government's own policies and communication strategies, because in a number of countries, including in the government politicians, not just in opposition politicians from populist parties. We have seen political parties, public officials, or even government minister who have used inflammatory and derogatory languages in their public communication, targeted various minorities, refugees, migrants in some countries, even the EU agenda. So, so even if you see these legislations which you analyze so, um, so correctly and so thoroughly, there is often minimum political will to adequately and appropriately respond to instances of hate speech, which is surfacing in society at, at large. And this also links then to the traditional media that are often playing a central role in portraying minorities, migrants, refugees, and so on in a negative light, they are scapegoating them for, for various problems in the society. And then technology, which has been originally held as a positive, uh, positive role, these companies are more and more recognized as enablers uh, of hate speech against those who are targeting by hate speech, and they are uh, also rightly criticized for their algorithms, which are exaggerating differences, contributing to polarization of society, and so on. So that's for the context. Now to the legislation. So you made a couple of comments and a couple of observations in the report. So here, I can only concur with you that this legislation is often not clear on definition of hate speech. And actually often those definitions of hate speech they use does not reflect international human rights standards, which differentiate between the types of hate speech based on its severity. So usually the legislation we have seen have been quite vague and overbroad and do not follow the treaty language concerning international covenant on civil and political rights and then quite chaotic and often haphazard interpretation by European court on in many hate speech cases, which then trickle down to national um, interpretation by judiciary on the country level 
or even the judiciary not even following the international human rights standards at all, or not even being aware of, uh, aware of them. So this is quite concerning for Article 19, because we find out that although legislation in many countries uh, contains often robust protection and guarantees for the right to freedom of expression and the right to equality, the applicable legislation does not fully comply with international standards, and then the countries often differ, obviously, in their approaches to different type of hate speeches, uh, which is dependent on the severity which they, they do not understand, and then there is a problem on the interpretation level. So I think the studies like you showed can actually contribute to some sort of harmonization of others or comparative standards and understanding of the topic more broadly. Now, I think I only have very little time left in my time allocated is the problem of the media and digital technologies. So here we fortunately have quite a lot of guidance for the countries which are members of the European Union from the EU forthcoming legislation and also from, uh, from, from the standards and frameworks such as uh, audiovisual media services directive and now with forthcoming DSA and DMA and uh, eventually also into, um, European Media Freedom Act. But beyond the countries which are in the EU, in Council of Europe, there is very diverging regulation of the media or understanding the different standards that should guide the press, broadcasting, and online content. I can also agree with the findings in the report that the content regulation that is related to the media, especially the issues such as terrorism, extremism, or even criminal defamation are still found. Uh, the broad legislation in this sense are still found in the European countries, which then uh, leads to problematic interpretation in individual cases. And then in terms of online content, despite this forthcoming um, EU-wide legislation uh, from the SNDMA, we have also seen a number of the countries adopting the regulation on the platforms for online in a way which is not compatible with the international human rights standards and the free criteria which are mentioned at the beginning of the report of legality, proportionality, and necessity. And the countries are at large delegating private censorship to uh, or censorship and interpretation of the legislation to private bodies, social media platforms or digital companies which are not uh, appropriately uh, equipped to make the assessment whether the speech can be legally um, restricted under international human rights standards. And then this uh, leads to a quite chaotic and diverging um, approaches to different type of, of, of speeches. And this, obviously, this is um, facilitated by the legislation such as uh, Network Enforcement Act or NetsDG in Germany or Loavia in, in France and so on. So this, um, this approach is quite chaotic, I would say, or quite uh, haphazard. And hopefully the, the regulation which will come on the European level will provide useful guid uh, guidance and obviously enforcement within the EU how this area should be regulated, but the legislation which, and this is important from the point of global consensus of Article 19, we also see this legislation replicated in other countries uh, beyond Europe, which do not have robust uh, democratic institution or independence of judiciary and rule of law where this is, uh, this is, this is, pro this is problematic. So these are just like brief remarks, which I want to mention on the report. And uh, we will be obviously very keen to collaborate in further work in this area, given our interest in robust protection of freedom of expression in legislation and making sure that this legislation meets international human rights standards. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much indeed for a very comprehensive uh, and very interesting discussion of the contemporary problems on something that maybe 30 or 40 years ago we would have thought was something that was could be banked in many countries of Western Europe. Um, now, I, I think there are two things I want to say. First, um, my screen uh, shows no one wanting to ask a question. I have lots of questions I would want to ask, and I'd much rather 
you would ask questions. So while we're preparing for Judge Annet to join us, please have some questions. We've had some very interesting uh, areas discussed, hate speech, uh, the great plutocracy, the best way of regulating the media, the um, problems in particular countries, and um, the idea of, of maybe having better codes rather than legislation, but a whole host of different ideas. So I hope you will uh, put some questions into the Q&A so we can have some authoritative answers. Now, I've given that moment uh, to hope that uh, uh, Judge Ernit is able to join us. Uh, they, we say third time lucky. So let's hope we're lucky this time. Judge Ernit. Uh, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. So I uh, switched off the camera. Perhaps the uh, I'm terribly sorry for, for this um, uh, te technical problem. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, invitation. I'm honored to, to um, try to speak here. Um, I have to make a disclaimer. Uh, first, um, I only express my personal opinion uh, and not the opinion of the uh, European Court of Justice. And I have to add an explanation why I do not comment the uh, uh, wonderful report, uh, because I am one of the authors of the country reports. Um, uh, and that's why it is perhaps um, not a, not a, the best idea. So um, could we have this um, uh, PowerPoint now? Thank you very much. Um, and move on to the second slide. Um, I will briefly uh, show the um, very recent developments of uh, the European Court of Justice to this particular article uh, that is um, a valid law since um, the end of, of um, uh, 2009. And uh, could we move on, please? To which we have all together now uh, 67 judgments, um, 39 judgments from the court and 28 judgments from the tribunal. Next one, please. As we see, um, the most important uh, judgments, the grand chamber judge judgments, are uh, not so many. There are 18, and uh, there were just one judgment per year or one and a half, a half judgment per year approximately until 2019. There was an explosion, so to say. We had five judgments to two topics, uh, to um, the uh, content sharing issue and to the right to be forgotten. And then we have had uh, three judgments already in 2022. Um, perhaps we will get some more. Since the uh, judgments of 2000, thank you, uh, judgments of 2019 have been already discussed, I will restrict myself to the very last years to um, the judgments uh, that um, are made 2020 or later. Next one, please. We have um, two main topics. Um, the content sharing and data retention. And then we have two judgments to some other minor, so to say minor issues. And um, to fit into the time limit, I will concentrate myself to the uh, two particular judgments because in my opinion, they express in a wonderful way um, uh, the way the court works today and, and um, uh, uh, performs the scrutiny of the uh, free expression. Next one, please. So, and next one. Um, so 
um, this the case um, five or seven from um, uh, 2018 is a case that concerns um, a lawyer who uh, made uh, in a radio interview some statements about homosexual persons. Particularly, he uh, expressed that he would not never hire a homosexual person to work in his law firm, and he does not wish to use the services of such persons. He was not um, uh, responsible, or it's not known whether he was responsible for recruitment in that firm, but there was no recruitment at that time in this law firm. And then there is this association, which is an association of lawyers that defends the rights of uh, LGBTI people in court proceedings, which brought the proceedings against NH before the competent court. And the court ordered NH to pay 10,000 euro to the association in damages and ordered extracts from that order to be published in a national daily newspaper. NH appealed, and so it um, came to Luxembourg. Next one, please. There were two main questions um, essentially raised in this case. The first one, does the statement of NH uh, that he would not hire a homosexual person to work in his law firm and would not wish to use the services of such persons constitute a discrimination in relation to employment within the meaning of Directive 2078? And if they do, is the association allowed to bring proceedings against NH in the absence of an unidentifiable victim? Next one, please. The court um, made a very detailed scrutiny in this case and um, uh, started uh, from referring to the earlier statements, on the one hand, um, to the statement that um, this concept in question may cover public statements, but on the other hand, that um, uh, there are also uh, statements uh, that may not uh, fall within the um, uh, application of this particular directive. Next one, please. To solve this um, contradiction, the court defined three criteria. And um, the first criteria concerns the status of the person. Next one, please. The second, the nature and the content of the statements, and the third, the context in which the statement was made. And then the uh, final uh, question, of course, in every um, fundamental rights case is the principle of proportionality, in which the, um, the court uh, stated that um, the directive, the discrimination, anti discrimination directive, uh, defines actually the scope of um, uh, the freedom of expression in this particular field. Next one, please. Um, what I found particularly interesting in this case um, uh, was uh, the uh, fine distinction between those who apply and those who do not. So, if we, um, uh, the uh, issue wasn't that there was an application procedure going on in this law firm, but it was that there are potential applicants. Um, and if they hear a statement like this, deriving from this particular law firm, they will perhaps in the future not apply in this law firm. And this, is, um, uh, uh, this was uh, reason enough 
um, to uh, come to the conclusion that um, um, a statement like this um, was uh, discrimination and uh, was prohibited by this um, directive and was not in contradiction with the uh, freedom of expression as um, stated in, in the charter. Next one, please. Um, the, to the second question, uh, just very briefly, um, uh, the court came to the conclusion that the association is, um, of course, um, uh, uh, entitled to, to raise uh, the claim and um, uh, there was a short reasoning to this too. So, two next one, please. And next one. Um, the second case um, concerns the question, what does this mean? The inside information. Um, it was a case of a journalist. So it concerns directly the um, uh, freedom of press. And um, uh, it was a case where um, uh, ec the, the journalists um, publishing articles to economic issues um, contacted um, some persons about rumors uh, that he was uh, that he intended intended to publish, and uh, these rumors um, uh, were um, able were entitled to to uh, influence the stock prices. Next one, please. Um, well, the question concerned the market abuse directive and particularly the question of um, whether this information, the publication of rumors, was of precise nature. Next one, please. Again, the court made a very fine distinction. Uh, the court distinguished between uh, two types of future events. Uh, in the first place, uh, the fact that the articles about these rumors will be published. And second, the content of these articles, the um, alleged takeover bits. Next one, please. Um, and of course, again, the um, principle of proportionality was in the center of the scrutiny of the court, uh, particularly um, uh, several aspects like the proposed price for the purchase, the reputation of the journalist. Next one, please. And in the end, um, the court came to the conclusion that a press article reporting a market rumor is capable of constituting information of precise nature, which might be um, uh, somewhat surprising, but um, it is indeed, uh, if it's uh, capable to uh, influence uh, stock market prices, uh, then um, it belongs with no doubt to the um, to the scope of of, of this um, directive. Next one, please. Um, we'll just move on a little bit because uh, we would like to come to the to last case um, to slide sixteen, and then yes, seventeen. Um, Excuse, yeah, ex um, what's, uh, exactly, this is 27. The last case um, uh, concerns uh, an action of Rep Republic of Poland. Uh, and this is the, the most recent case of the um, Court of Justice. 
And uh, it concerns the um, uh, action against action of annulment of um, against the Article 17 of the Directive 2019 7, uh, 7, um, uh, 190. Uh, which um, concerns the measures to achieve a well-functioning marketplace for copyright. Um, according to, to um, uh, this uh, provision, uh, in order to be exempted from all liability for giving the public access to copyright protected works or other protected sub subject matter uploaded by the users in breach of copyright, Online content sharing service providers are required by reason of this article to carry out preventive moni monitoring of all the content which their users wish to upload. And in order to do so, those service providers must use IT tools which enable the prior aut automatic filtering of that content. So, and the Republic of Poland questioned um, the um, uh, legitimacy of, of uh, this uh, provision. Um, according to the court, um, this uh, question falls um, uh, within the scope of Article 10 and Article 11 of the Charter. And it uh, entails a limitation of uh, the freedom of expression. Next one, please. Next one, please. And what was um, is particularly interesting in this case is uh, the uh, extremely exhaustive scrutiny of the principle of proportionality. The court brings in um, the wording of um, Article 52, uh, paragraph one of uh, the Charter. And uh, defines the principle of uh, proportionality uh, in a way, in a, in a more um, exhaustive way than before. Next one, please. I uh, made a little um, table here. Uh, to bring out the differences to the uh, to the earlier um, cases cited, and um, the the main difference is uh, that uh, the need to protect the rights and freedoms of others. This is wording of Article 20, uh, 52, Paragraph 1 of the Charter, but um, uh, here uh, the the court emphasizes uh, this uh, particularly. The next one, please. And so um, this is a huge topic, of course, um, content sharing um, and the, the balancing question, um, why it is so difficult? Uh, because we don't have uh, one right against another, but we have a triangle here, at least, if not more. And uh, to balance in a triangle is a very tricky question. And that's why uh, in this case, uh, the scrutiny of the principle of proportionality is very long. Next one, please. Um, in this um, uh, reasoning, uh, the court has to or uh, names the question why it differs um, from the very clear statement that he made in uh, another case, in an earlier case, YouTube and Siando, where the court said that uh, the court has held in numerous occasions that measures that consist in requiring a service provider to introduce exclusively at, at its own display. Uh, expense, a screening system which entails general and permanent monitoring in order to prevent any future infringements of in intellectual property rights, in incompatible with the directive of electronic commerce. And yet, in this case, next one, please. In this case, in Poland versus uh, Parliament and Council, the uh, court comes to the conclusion that such um, uh, 
regulation in this directive is in accordance with the Charter. Next one, please. So thank you very much for the patience. And uh, once again, I'm very sorry for these technical issues. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very glad that eventually, um, third time lucky, it all worked. Uh, so thank you very much for that very interesting presentation of, of the case law. Now I'm looking at uh, my screen. I can't find anyone who is wanting to ask a question. So I will start, we've got about 10 minutes or so left. Uh, I, was, I was going to ask a very general question, if I may, and I was going to ask one of you to answer it and I'll come to someone else for another question. Could I ask Jana to this question? From many of the presentations, it would appear that freedom of expression uh, is for different reasons under threat and their difficulties in politicians taking a tough enough line. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the ability to strike the right balance uh, to ensure freedom of expression? You know, my work is to be optimistic. Otherwise I have nothing to do in, in the European parliament or in any parliament. Uh, but frankly speaking, let me, let me give you an example uh, from Estonia. I'm coming from Estonia, which is, you know, on the Russian border. And we have pretty big Russian speaking community. I'm, I'm Russian speaker myself. Uh, we have like 20% of Russian speakers. And of course, as we're a tiny country, uh, so many of these people were following Russian television for 30 years of Estonian independence. On 25th of February, all Russian TV channels were banned and many of Russian news outlets were banned, but this is in most cases, pure war propaganda, which is kind of okay. But if you are mm, banning uh, TV channels and uh, news outlets and so on and so forth, you have to provide an alternative, which we cannot do. For we don't have a single Russian speaking newspaper, uh, daily newspaper in Estonia, and we have Russian TV channel where we have less than three hours of original uh, program uh, a day, which is nothing. I mean, and here we are, yes, we are in war. Uh, we see that we have to ban this propaganda. And on the other hand, we don't have alternative. This is, uh, you know, for me, this is also the question of freedom of speech for how long will it last? Uh, what are the solutions and so on and so forth. This is approximately maybe, maybe more, more black and white example of what was said by uh, Barbara Bukowska, yes? You know, where, where is the balance between, you know, the interest of the state and real people? Can you imagine some, I don't know, retired lady at the age of, let's say, 82 years who is living together with her TV set? And now she has nothing. She is kind of in limbo, you know. This is a problem. And I believe that we have to, to address these problems like everywhere. But again, I believe that we have to speak to people and we have to speak to them in the language which they understand. And it goes not only about, I mean, it goes to about, it's about any Russia, any national minority in European Union. And another thing, of course, which is problematic for me, I'm, I'm, I'm European, I'm a member of European Parliament, and of course I have to promote the things we do here, but we are so boring. I mean, we are so boring. Sometimes, you know, when I, when I read our press releases, I think, oh my God, you know, all flies will just die. It's, it's, it's not normal. We, we are boring and lazy. And this is, this is not about freedom of speech, you know. This is about, about being professional. And at certain at certain point, you know, we just lose it. And you think we think that uh, there is there is a deep conflict. We all are supposed to share common values. We speak about European values constantly. But if we are trying to be in this common values bubble, bad word maybe in the common values world, you know, what about freedom of speech? What about freedom of expression? Is somebody allowed to question any of our common values? This is also, you know, a question of balance. 
and uh, uh, I don't see, especially now during this Ukrainian war, I don't see a room for this for this discussion, which is then, in my view, pretty dangerous. For if you if we don't have proper dialogue with people who don't share our values, uh, I believe uh, we are creating really bad situation. You know, so I believe we have to be very open and we have to speak with people. And if it comes to media, even to PR, we have to be very professional and attractive. Or if we don't, we will not, uh, we will not reach this goal. Maybe I was speaking kind of, you know, chaotically, but you know, you just stepped on, just put some salt on my wound. <laughs> for, for former journalists, it's so bad, you know, to look how are we communicating with Europeans. It's really extremely, extremely boring. Well, that is your I was going to ask if I might, Barbara Ruskovic, uh, for this question. You spoke about the dangers for, in certain states of government control, and you spoke about the dangers of plutocracy. Uh, and bearing in mind um, the control that certain rich people have, or plutocrats have, over social media, which is the more dangerous? You are asking whether it's more dangerous the control from the government or control from the private sector. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 it really depends. Like if you are talking about a country like Russia, obviously it's more dangerous uh, the control from, from the state since we have you know authoritarian regime and no freedom of expression and no democratic institutions to speak of in the country. I think we need to be vigilant about both and rather than you know putting them against each other to address the danger of their own merits. You know, obviously the states are responsible on the international human rights standards to comply and to uh, properly enforce the standards they sign up to, which on the level of corporate actors is different responsibility. It's more ethical, moral obligations under the business and human rights uh, standards. However, I think that what you touched on in their like plutocracy, I think that in Europe, we often focus too much on the content when we speak about digital issues rather than addressing this dominant power or the dominant control of the few companies, actually few individuals over the digital sector. So I think in the terms of measures that, that we are adopting for the company's regulation, we actually need to look more closely in the issues of competition, on the monopolies, and also what sort of measures a part of censorship we can uh, adopt to address this, this dominance over the digital, digital sector. And actually, this is what I, I, when I mentioned some of this restrictive legislation of a digital sphere, um, the legislation often gives, gives companies more power uh, rather than taking the power from them because we delegate the censorship control to them. We want them to remove more content or less content instead of addressing their business models and also the power and dominance they have over the digital space. So I would I would say the danger comes from, from both sides and we need to address it it's in, in a small manner rather than saying this, this one is more problematic than the other. Well, thank you very much indeed, Vavora. I was going to ask one question now to uh, Ricardo. I don't know whether Mario feels he's able to speak um, and also to our, our, our Tamiza. And it's this, having heard all these um, presentations, where do you think, what do you, each of you think is the most important work that needs to be addressed in relation to freedom of speech. Ricardo, why don't you go first? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. Um, well, for sure, I mean, the, um, the current, uh, the, the, the most topical issue of, of trying to, um, Re redefine or re reshaping the debate on online speech in general and on, on whether we want to uh, keep considering these platforms of, as private companies and, and with, with what comes uh, as a result of this or whether we want to 
to to look at them as as sort of um, government actors or quasi government actors, uh, but this has consequences at, uh, um, as well. And there, there was I always mention an Italian case um, uh, that was quite interesting. Was about um, very 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 briefly. It was about the uh, a neo fascist organization that was banned by Facebook. Um, and, and they sued Facebook uh, to, to regain access to their pages. Uh, and and they eventually the Italian judges said they were entitled to, to, to regain access to Facebook. Uh, and the, the reasoning is quite interesting because it was, it, they, they, the, the Italian judges said um, uh, freedom of association and freedom of expression um, trump uh, ec the economic freedom of, of Facebook to determine uh, its its own policies, um, and so I think it's a it's a very paradoxical um, uh, outcome of of a, of a case uh, where you have uh, where you eventually have more fascist speech around, um, starting from the premise of uh, of, of saying that. Uh, Political free uh, association um, is is more important than economic freedom. So you start from a certain ideological perspective, and you end up with a completely uh, unexpected result of, of having more uh, fascist speech allowed uh, uh, than it would have you would have had uh, by deciding to protect freedom of, of economic freedom of, of Facebook in this case. So I think that's the most important. Uh, topic to take on. So trying to uh, 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 face and, and, and try to, to, to solve uh, as, as possible these uh, paradoxes, these uh, contradictions uh, that lie, uh, that, that I think exist from, from both ideological perspectives. Um, we, we've seen uh, also the American debate uh, changing a lot in, in the past decade, I would say. Um, and, and, and I think there's contradictions, quite quite strong ones uh, from both sides. And so I think that's the most uh, urgent uh, question to tackle, both from academics, from journalists, from um, public officials, politicians, whatever. Uh, I think that that's the most important part, to try to um, to decide, uh, I mean, where we stand by trying to be honest about the potential outcomes of our of our perspective and, and try to uh, not to contradict ourselves uh, just for the sake of this, the specific case. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I was going to ask the media very briefly because we're nearly at the end of our session. What um, the, the same question, what do you think is the most important there we are, you've unmuted. Yes, thank you. I am still having some connection problems. So um, I would follow up on what was just said about the relation with those powerful new actors. Uh, they are not that new anymore, <laughs> the platforms, the internet intermediaries. Um, I think this is something of crucial importance and uh, at the Council of Europe, uh, we have tried not to see them anymore as separate actors, but as partners. And uh, the Council has developed a partnership with a number of powerful companies, including uh, Microsoft, Facebook, now Meta. Uh, we have regular meetings with them and we are trying to involve them in the standard setting work, also to listen to them it is obvious that the time of self-regulation of their work by, by companies, by the business companies, by platforms um, has passed and the state needs to take, uh, the governments need to take action, but they cannot just impose rules. All this needs to be uh, developed together. So this partnership is important for us and uh, we are going to continue to involve them. For example, now we have started a reflection in the Council of Europe on uh, metaverse, on you know the big project about you know future virtual realities and 
um, the protection of human rights of rule of law in that uh, virtual space. And the other reflection that I would like to share with the, with the participants is that um, journalism and journalists remain of key importance. And the situation um, revealed by all recent reports is a, a serious deterioration of, of the situation, including the physical situation of journalists. And this um, requires continued protection. The platform on the protection of journalism and journalists of the Council of Europe has noted, and they, they just published their annual report, an increase of over 40% of the alert, um, alerts uh, submitted to the Council of Europe about pressure and harassment and uh, you know attacks against journalism so uh, um, despite you know the new focus is uh, the protection of journalists should be uh, should remain a key priority thank you well, well thank you very much mario uh, sent me a message to say that he's unfortunately had to leave so i think what i should do is two things um, first is to thank everyone for a most stimulating debate. Um, it's been a great privilege for me to chair such an interesting discussion. Um, and it's gone from the very general to the very specific. And it has been a real privilege for Ely to have uh, such uh, people with such an intimate knowledge of, of what we uh, face uh, in this debate. And it's given, I think, Ricardo, and I'm sure I speak for Mario, uh, the really importance uh, of this subject. Uh, but finally, I just wanted to say a thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, they say that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And if this seminar has done anything, it's to emphasize the importance of the need constantly to struggle to maintain freedom of expression, and in particular, the freedom of those who are so vital to us, journalists and people who fight the cause. Thank you all very, very much indeed, and good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.